Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the CW and Tenable webinar series. Uh, this episode is entitled, How to Inform and Enrich Your Organization's Threat Models Using Vulnerability Management. Wanted to take a couple of minutes here to review some housekeeping items before we get started. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar uh, that you'd like us to address at the end, uh, please drop us a note in the Q&A widget within the WebEx client. You may have to mouse over the, the presentation screen and there should be a little Q&A button. Uh, if you don't see it right away, it might be under the, the more little hamburger wheel there. We'll get as, to as many of these questions as we can at the end of the webinar. And we'll also follow up afterwards if there's any questions that we don't address uh, today. We'll be recording this webinar and sending it out uh, to those of you who have registered after the webinar has attended. And for those of you who stay for the whole webinar, you'll also be receiving a $5 gift card. I want to take a moment to thank our, our friends at Tenable for uh, helping sponsor this event and, and being our partner in, in the vulnerability management space. So before we get started, uh, I think this is a good opportunity uh, as the first episode of the series was presented by Scalar, a CDW company. And as of January, uh, we've formally been integrated into, into the CDW Canada team. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for those of you who worked mostly with the Scalar folks or, or the CDW Canada folks prior to January to get a better idea of, of what uh, the new uh, partnership looks like. So in January, we integrated into CDW Canada, which uh, allows us to, to bring C, uh, Scalar's consultative approach to all of the areas that, that we focus on and to align that with CDW's international capabilities and breadth. So not only are, are we able to, to work with the, the customers that, that we had already, uh, we're also able to leverage uh, the, the, the way that CDW does business and, and be able to expand uh, the, the way that we do things on a much broader scale than we had been able to before. A little bit about me. Uh, for those of you who missed our first episode, my name is Mitch Kelsey. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity advisor here with CDW Canada. I represent a risk advisory services practice in Western Canada where I lead discussions related to risk advisory consulting, uh, offensive security, and vulnerability management services. I'm one of two tenable guardians here in Canada. And I come to cybersecurity a little bit differently than, than some of my colleagues in this space. I started off uh, working for a, a strategic security consultancy where cybersecurity was a facet, but looked at it more from a, a national security and, and intelligence approach. And so whenever we're, we're looking at things, I tend to take a threat modeling type approach. So I'm, I'm really glad we're able to talk a little bit about that in, in this webinar today. When I'm not uh, chatting with folks about cybersecurity, you can find me playing soccer or, or working in the kitchen or, or spending time with my wife, my two little boys, and my bulldog tank. Let's cover the, the agenda for today's webinar, and then we can get into some of the details. So first of all, I just want to have a quick recap of what we talked about in the first episode of the series for, for those of you who weren't, weren't able to attend or, or for, for those of you who just need a quick refresher. And then we'll get into actually understanding how threat modeling and vulnerability management work together and, and how organizations' attack surfaces have changed over time. Then we're going to cover specifically how vulnerability management works in some of these new spaces. So we're going to look at uh, the Internet of Things and operational technology environments. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the SDLC, and we're also going to talk about uh, what vulnerability management looks like in the cloud. Once we've had the chance to talk about each each one of those three environments, then we're going to talk about where vulnerability management sits in those spaces and how working with teams that uh, are primarily involved in those spaces, how that integration works and how vulnerability management can help uh, improve uh, and support the work that those teams are already doing. And then at the end, we'll be able to get to any questions that you have throughout the webinar. So in the first, so we covered three primary questions that organizations often have to address themselves. First of which is, is one that commonly is asked uh, of security teams in any organization is from business leadership teams or others is, how do we know whether or not we are prepared for uh, any threat that, that we see out in the world? Uh, this week, there's been uh, a lot of buzz around some pretty significant vulnerabilities 
zero days from, from a couple of major providers that uh, I'm sure people are having to answer questions about. So this is, this is as good an example as any. And really that is a, is a clear understanding of whether or not you have a clear uh, grasp of what your environment represents and what are the threats that are associated with that. And the way that we do that is understanding which assets are critical to our business operations from one side of things. And on the other side is once we understand which assets we are responsible for and how they're critical to our business, also understanding what are things that could go wrong with those assets? What are the threats that these assets face? And then we ask, well, what can we do about these threats? What can we do about understanding this asset criticality? We talked about you know, some of the options that are available to organizations once they have this informed uh, decision-making opportunity. And there's a couple of different ways that you can address these risks. You can directly remediate it. So that may be working with your patch management teams to, to remediate the risk and, and make sure that those systems are upgraded appropriately. Uh, we may have to compensate for it if there's some reason why that it's not possible to patch a system that there may be some other compensating control that you put in place, uh, isolating that asset or uh, changing who has access to it in some way. Or in some circumstances, it, it may be the case that neither one of those options are, are available to you and, and you need to accept that risk and put a plan in place to prepare for something in, in case that risk is exploited. Then we talked a little bit about how we set up the stage to have a threat model and conversation we can dive into a little bit. So there are a lot of different ways that organizations can perform threat modeling. Uh, fundamentally, these models uh, address three primary aspects about an organization's environment. And one of them is designing and, and illustrating an abstraction of your environment that you can use to understand what the impacts are going to look like. Then there's an identification of potential threat actors, and that's going to cover everything from a determined attacker who is upset about your organization in some way and wants to, to do bad things. It can also cover a variety of, of other issues as well, uh, everything from availability concerns to from, from outdated software or, or misconfigurations to, uh, in some cases, outside of vulnerability management, some uh, some unexpected actions, maybe a, a flood of your data center is a, is a threat that you might have to face that you want to ensure you include in your threat model. And then finally, a, a catalog of relevant threat events that, that these potential vectors may uh, leverage against your environment. So Mother Nature isn't necessarily somebody who is determined to, to cause problems for you, but understanding if, you, if, you're, uh, if your business is on a floodplain, that might be important to you. That's important on one side. Also understanding if, if there's some specific aspect about your business that somebody may try and take advantage of for, for a variety of reasons, whether financially motivated or they're upset about something about the business, that's, that's important information too. What putting these three aspects together really does is it allows you uh, to have an attacker's view of your environment and understand where vulnerabilities may lie in different aspects of your infrastructure or as, as a process flows throughout your environment and be able to make those uh, informed decisions about what you're gonna do about it once you have this view of the environment. So if you're interested in learning more about some of the different ways that you can do threat modeling, the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University does a fantastic job at breaking this down. They're generally a great resource uh, in information security more generally and I'd recommend taking a look, uh, you can pretty easily find this blog post by searching threat modeling in Carnegie Mellon University. So where does vulnerability management fit into conversations about threat modeling? So there's sort of two aspects to this. One of them is understanding the anticipated threats against critical assets that you're already aware of in your environment to help you make those decisions about whether we need to upgrade a piece of of hardware or software, whether there's a, a misconfiguration we have to be concerned about. The other part of it is the ability to find assets in your environment that maybe were not included in your threat model to validate 
that your model accurately reflects the, the risk to your actual environment. And in particular, we're going to cover some of these assets that may exist in your environment that are outside of the, the typical servers and end user machines that uh, a couple of years ago were, were the primary focus of, of these threat models. So the, the attack services that we wanted to cover today, a uh, couple different areas of focus. One of them is uh, the Internet of Things and operational technology spaces. This seems to be a, an exploding aspect of, of uh, cybersecurity because more and more organizations are leveraging the power of, of these assets in their environment for all sorts of beneficial reasons. Uh, and, and they're really hard using some traditional tools to, to wrap your mind around. We're also going to talk about the SDLC and how software development and vulnerability management uh, have, have interplay and, and where opportunities are to, to work more closely together there. And we're going to talk about cloud environments and, and some of the similarities with uh, traditional on-premise environments and, and where some of those differences may lie. So I don't know if any of you remember a couple of years ago, there was a story about a Vegas casino that had an internet connected fish tank that uh, got hacked and was used by uh, the threat actor to uh, exfiltrate a fair amount of data about that casino environment. I think this is a really good example about how to talk about IoT in, in a corporate IT environment and where both vulnerability management and threat modeling in general fit into that. So in this case, the, the organization was using the internet, internet connected capabilities for this fish tank to check pH balances for the fish because they don't want their, their fish being hurt uh, in day-to-day -day operations and wanted to get a handle on that from a, a central location. The unfortunate part was that it wasn't uh, appropriately protected and uh, an attacker was able to use that and, and jump into their corporate network. So uh, a good lesson to learn from this is it's important to understand what assets that your organization is responsible for, even if they include fish tanks, and ensure that there's, there's proper segmentation and uh, and that you, you clearly understand the, the functions that, that those assets are supposed to be performing and what they're not supposed to be performing and ensure that your security controls align with that. When we talk about the SDLC, uh, for those of you who are not as familiar, the software development life cycle. So uh, in, in modern uh, software development shops, uh, they, uh, tend to follow an iterative process for software development that allows teams to move more quickly in an agile way and in, in increasingly in, in a DevOps way where uh, your, your hosting ops team and your development team are working in close coordination to, to, to commit code faster than they were able to before. And this is, this is fantastic in terms of a, a team's ability to uh, add value for their customers more quickly. You can think software as a service companies. This is increasingly important to ensure that your, your customers are, are happy with, with what you're providing and that you're continuing to bring value over time. Uh, there's, but there's ongoing concerns with that. If those, if those changes to your application are not tested through that process, it, it enables organizations uh, to, to commit code that may have vulnerabilities or, or flaws in it uh, more quickly. Uh, and this bears true both for the code itself uh, as it makes its way into production and also the pipeline uh, that DevOps teams are leveraging to be able to, to do that. So we can see here an, an example of a, of a work de uh, deployment workflow using Docker that there's a couple instances where there is risk to an organization uh, if, if the the work that you're doing to deploy that code is not assessed as it moves through this pipeline. And so you can see here, as, as uh, the, the Docker image is, is moved through the environment, once an image for a, a Docker instance is built that is going to be used to scale out a, a microservice in an environment, if at the point that that gold image is not scanned or, or tested in, in the parlance that uh, DevOps teams use, it can become a real challenge because 
if you're going to replicate this Docker instance over and over, and there is some underlying vulnerability in, in some aspect of, of that Docker instance, now every single asset that are associated with that are also at risk. Uh, and this is commonly the case with, with Docker instances. You hear about this all the time, uh, that, uh, that attackers are able to escape a Docker instance and, and get into the, the host infrastructure or they're able to poison a gold image like this and, and be able to exploit a much larger uh, aspect of an organization than they would otherwise be. Same is true once that image is pushed to the quality assurance that there's, there's that risk that if, if there have been changes to that environment, that if those are, are not assessed before it goes into production, that you may have concern about misconfiguration there as well. And this is where an integration with vulnerability management can really make a big difference, which is something that we'll cover a little bit later in the webinar. When we're talking about vulnerability management in the cloud, uh, there's, it, this can become a, a point of anxiety for some people. It is treated in some circles as, as a very different infrastructure model than, than a traditional on-premise uh, infrastructure, but You've probably seen this quote before that the cloud really is just other people's computers. Uh, but there are some differences in what an organization is responsible for in, in a cloud environment than they would be with their own on-premise applications. And so I use AWS's example of, of what's called the shared responsibility model. Uh, other cloud service providers have something similar, but I thought this was a, a good example to be able to walk through. So the difference is that the underlying hardware and hosting software uh, for, for these servers that, that organizations have access to, that responsibility for the maintenance and the, the appropriate configuration of, of the underlying infrastructure is now abstracted and, and put in the hands of your cloud service provider, in this case, Amazon. But what organizations are still responsible for is what they're leveraging that infrastructure for, what software they are, are putting there, how those assets are configured, uh, you know, what secrets are, are being disclosed, uh, how those, those systems are integrated. All of those things are still the responsibility of the organization leveraging that cloud service. A lot of people uh, are under the assumption that just because it's in the cloud, it's secure. And that can be true, but there is still work to, to be done, no different than it is in an on-premise environment. So let's talk about how we can be successful uh, applying vulnerability management to these environments, how we work with the teams who live that uh, environment day to day and, and what opportunities there are for orchestration and integration. So there's, there's a reason why uh, vulnerability management is, uh, is an important part of this conversation. The Center for Information Security's top 20 always includes uh, vulnerability management and configuration management in usually the top five uh, critical controls that they have, and there's a good reason for it. And you can see the story as, as you look at the other parts of that top five control list, that it's talking about uh, a clear understanding, uh, a visibility and control over the assets that you have in your environment, whether they're hardware or software assets, whether you're talking about information assets, having a clear understanding of what you're responsible for and ensuring that they are configured and protected as appropriately. Uh, if, if you're able to, to get that correctly, it's going to put you in a much stronger position than you would otherwise be. So what does it mean to, to talk about vulnerability management uh, in these examples? So we've broken down the SDLC a little bit into two components. One of them is, uh, being able to manage the, the vulnerabilities that may exist in the applications that your team are developing and, and putting into production, and also the, the security of, of the pipeline itself, the process of, of moving applications from uh, a development environment into production. And also on the cloud side, looking not only at the security of, of the the infrastructure that you're leveraging and how you configure it, but also the hosted applications that sit on top of it. So again, when we're talking about 
what success looks like in the IoT and operational technology spaces, there's, there's a couple things to, to keep in mind. One of the principal concerns when you're talking about an IoT assets or an OT environment that is connected to your corporate IT environment, one of the critical concerns, and it, it is oftentimes a way that, uh, that, that you can see challenges with, uh, with an infection from some uh, you know, internet worm or, or some other issue where uh, there's, a, there's a, a weakness in, in a corporate infrastructure, oftentimes because there is some unknown device that is not intended to be on the corporate network that has been attached in some way. So whether that is uh, a device that is typically used in the OT environment that had been misconfigured and, and is exposed in a way that it shouldn't be, if it's a, somebody bringing a, a device from home that they're not supposed to, you can think in a, in a college environment uh, uh, for students who are trying to circumvent your, your typical uh, school infrastructure, they might bring their own routers from home, uh, which can cause some security challenges there. Similar thing in, in corporate or especially heavy industry environments. Also, uh, potentially bad actors who are, are going to be using things like rogue access points uh, to be able to try and, and sniff traffic and, and, uh, and steal credentials to cause problems in your environment. So that visibility of, of those assets that are, are unknown to the business is really important. And being able to provide that information so that you can take appropriate uh, measures to control those assets, whether you're blocking them, whether it's something that, that was missed in, a, in an asset management aspect and it needs to be enrolled in, in some corporate process, very useful information to have. And we can go back to the fish taking example we talked about a little bit earlier. It's not necessarily bad as an organization that you have an internet connected fish tank. Uh, as we can see, there's, there's definitely some benefits to making sure those, those fish are happy. Uh, but what's really important is that this fish tank and, and other assets like it, whether you're talking about TVs or iPads to, to check visitors into your business, any of those sort of things, that these devices are included in your threat model, that you have visibility over, over them, uh, what they have access to and how they're configured, and that you have you know, clear visibility of, of the controls that are in place to protect those assets as well as the rest of your business. When we're talking more specifically about OT environments that may be segregated from your corporate IT environment, there's some additional concerns that, that organizations face uh, to make sure that, that people are safe in these environments. When we're talking about uh, information security in, in OT environments, we're talking as much about safety as we are about information security. Because if something malfunctions with a kiln, it's very different than what happens if, you know, uh, there's, there's a problem with, with your fish tank, as an example. And so in OT environments, something that is, has been identified this way for quite a long time something called the Purdue model. And what this allows organizations to do is clearly understand the delineations between aspects of your operational technology environment from what you would consider your enterprise zone, so your, your corporate IT assets or uh, the, the, the business planning and logics network, that those are segregated from what is considered your manufacturing and your safety zone. So your manufacturing zone covers all of the layers of control that you would expect to see, uh, all the way up to monitoring systems and, and site-wide uh, visibility systems to be able to understand you know, how things are working in the plant. But again, that those are separated from the actual machines themselves. And that leveraging a, a, a vulnerability management system that understands the Purdue model will help you as an organization to ensure that assets that sit at those various layers of your organization are segregated appropriately and that they can only talk to the machines that they're supposed to. So that not only is this done uh, securely from uh, information security and, and data leakage perspective, but it also ensures the safety of, of the workers in those environments, that there's nothing inappropriate that's gonna speak to uh, the underlying robots and kilns that, that sit at the bottom of this layer uh, that that have important and, and potentially dangerous work to do. So all of this is, is powered by understanding an accurate 
inventory of the assets that you have in your environment, uh, as well as the network diagram that you have to ensure that, that these assets are segregated, like we were just talking about, and that those trust barriers exist and, and are properly configured so that the machines that are not supposed to talk to each other uh, don't have that ability and that protocols are, are mapped in a way that, that only certain ports and services are allowed to speak to each other. So when we're talking about how we support teams in, in a DevOps environment in, within the SDLC, one of the most helpful ways to think about this as, as a security professional is we like to think of security vulnerabilities as, as special and important because they, we feel like they have you know, additional impacts to a business. But for developers, software vulnerabilities are just bugs no different than any other bugs that they come across. Uh, and if we are able to address uh, security vulnerabilities as a quality concern, that's a language that software developers use on a regular basis. They include quality assurance as part of their, their development process. And being able to support that can, can help them. Because fundamentally, if the more time that your software development team spends squashing bugs, the less team that they can spend coding new and improved features for your customers. So anything that we as, as security folks can do to help assist that and remove those barriers in the tools that our, our software development uh, partner teams use, the better. And so there's been a, a series of efforts to integrate vulnerability management platforms into the SDLC to allow teams on the development side to use the tools that they are comfortable with uh, and leverage the capabilities that a uh, vulnerability management platform like Tenable would have to help uh, ensure that, that these bugs are caught as early as possible in a way that's helpful for, for those development teams to understand and mitigate. So in the past, this unfortunately had been something where, where you'd expect that a, a large report that has a, a lot of uh, security specific details would be handed over to, to your delivery teams or as we were just talking, your, your operational technology teams that says, here's the flaws that we found in, in your environment and here's what we need you to do to fix it. But that, uh, that adds additional work for your, for your delivery folks and in, in many cases, it, it's not providing them the information that they need to be successful. So as much as possible, being able to architect a system where these problems are addressed in line with the resources that they have access to is really important. And it's really important for both teams, to be honest. Uh, this allows your development teams to leverage APIs in their environment to be able to validate that the mitigation efforts that they've taken are, are successful and that that those sort of two-way APIs also will inform the vulnerability management team on, on the security side that that had been done effectively. And so being able to ensure that uh, these queries are, are possible as early as possible in the process uh, can ensure that your vulnerability management team have the tools and, and the visibility they need from, from a risk perspective in their environment. And the development team now have a new tool that they can leverage uh, to be able to ensure they, they can focus their time and attention on feature development. This also bears true of the hosting infrastructure. So we talked a little bit about how uh, the development pipeline works in Docker environments and uh, being able to identify where there may be flaws from the hosting operations perspective as early as possible is really important. Uh, these teams already are using orchestration technologies uh, to be able to, to align a series of, of different uh, technology partners to be able to take an instance and very quickly uh, uh, put it into production and scale it as necessary to be able to meet the needs of the business. And being able to embed your vulnerability management processes into that structure to ensure that only safe containers go out uh, and that you're informing the team if there are vulnerabilities before that happens as a quality assurance check, ensures that uh, the, the team is able to uh, breathe a little bit easier that what they're putting out into the world is uh, going to be safe from those flaws, uh, whether that's 
ones that are exploitable that that security team would be focused about but there's also other flaws that that can be discovered that's helpful for them to know if there's availability concerns if there's data integrity concerns uh, that can, can can cause problems for your your uh, development ops uh, partners and uh, providing them that visibility early uh, can ensure that they can focus again their time and attention on on things that make their customers happy and finally when we're talking about what this looks like in the cloud, there, there's a, quite a bit of overlap between this and what we were just talking about in the SDLC. Uh, Docker, as an example, is fundamentally a, a, a cloud native way to, to scale software development in your environment. And uh, so as this, as this is, there's, there's quite a bit of overlap between these two environments. And some of this delineation is important to keep in mind that as we were talking about, about the shared responsibility model that your cloud service provider is responsible for, for some of this, but being able to catch those configuration challenges uh, as you leverage that, that hosted infrastructure is, is important. And how that responsibility falls to your team depends a little bit on what you're doing in the cloud. Uh, there are going to be some assets that you have in your environment that are, are typical discrete assets. You're setting up a, an S3 bucket that uh, is functioning no different than a, than a regular server that you would expect to see with RAM and, and processing power and, and all those good things. So the typical recommendations that you would expect for any other asset that you'd have in your environment apply. Being able to ensure that the operating system that you're using the applications and services that are laying on top of it are configured properly and that they're up to date and uh, that those appropriate uh, security controls are in place. One thing that's different in cloud environments than you would typically see in uh, more typical on-prem environments is now that you're leveraging tools like Docker and Kubernetes to be able to scale assets over time, it's increasingly the case that the specific that count that you have in your environment fluctuates tremendously because at any given point to meet the needs of your customers, you may be spinning up or spinning down uh, containers to be able to expand your ability to serve your customers. And that's difficult to track from an asset management perspective because you're not necessarily now dealing with physical assets that are domain joined that you know what they're supposed to be doing and, and you track them over their life cycle. Life cycle for these containers can be quite a bit shorter. And so really being able to treat that more as a system and ensure that controls are in place to evaluate the system is really important. So being able to, to confirm right from the point that that image is, is pulled out of your, your repository all the way till it's, it's put into production, that you're able to track and confirm that those containers are configured properly and that they, they're not uh, introducing any new vulnerabilities is really helpful. It's a little bit of a different way to think about it, but it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind as well. So that covers the topics for today's webinar. Uh, want to talk a little bit about what upcoming episodes are going to look like and, and what the dates are, are going to be for those. And so we're, we're tentatively setting these for the middle of March and middle of May, but you can think of this more in terms of a, a spring time frame and a summer time frame. So next we're gonna talk uh, in further detail about how vulnerability management sits within other aspects of your security environment and some of these other partner environments like we talked about today. And then for the final episode, we're gonna talk about how and why vulnerability management is changing over time. So I wanna take an opportunity now to to open up the floor for some questions. Uh, I see that there's a couple here on the line that we will uh, we'll be able to address. And if there's any others, uh, like I mentioned, if you can find the Q&A button up in the top right-hand corner, uh, feel free to enter them here. If we don't get to them today, we'll, we'll definitely follow up after this. Awesome, okay, thank you so much, Mitch. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Taylor Caroline. I'm a part of the CDW marketing team. Uh, we do have our first question here. Um, some companies work with dynamic container scanning, scans in runtime, catching vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities introduced by software installs, post build, or zero day attacks. Tenable has a product that performs this function or just 
static scanning. So the, the Tenable Web Application Scanner is something that is intended to scan assets in production or a near production environment. So that really, when we're talking about that container scanning, you're looking at, at two aspects of this. And, and really that, that should be the approach that, that organizations are taking if they're looking at this comprehensively. On one hand, you want to be able to catch as much of this as possible from an image perspective and as it's moving through the pipeline and, and you know, breaking a build and, and sending that back to the repo if there's a problem that was inherent in that build. But as you mentioned, there are instances where post-build there are, there are flaws that, that may be introduced that's important to keep in mind. And that is where your web application scanner, which is the dynamic scanner, uh, is valuable. So that itself is going to be scanning uh, assets that are in production or, or in, in near production and give you that ongoing scanning capability over time. So on the back end, you're confirming the containers. On the front end, you're seeing what that looks like in production. Perfect, thanks so much. We do have another question. Um, how do you differentiate between permanent and ephemeral assets in an environment where you have both? Okay, so we talked a little bit in a cloud environment where there's different types of assets that you're concerned about. But there's also another circumstance where you may be uh, responsible for ephemeral assets. And a university is a really good example of this where an organization itself has a series of, of devices that are corporate owned that are joined to the domain that they're really familiar with. That they've been set up with some gold image that they know exactly what they're looking for. But outside of that, you have a series of, of assets that others are bringing into your environment. So you have university students and professors who are bringing a wide variety of different assets you know, onto your campus, as an example. And in that circumstance, being able to get visibility to what's on your network and the potential security concerns that may be associated with that is really important. So not only are you focusing on doing the vulnerability and and configuration scans of assets that you control to make sure that you're uh, treating them appropriately and, and patching them as needed. But you're also discovering those assets that may be connected to your network in some way, even if it's on a guest network, to be able to provide that context to your security team on what challenges you may be facing. It may not be something that you have a, the ability to do something about. In universities, there's, there's fewer things that you're able to do to restrict users from accessing your environment but at least you have that visibility and context in case something happens. Awesome. Uh, just another question we have, how do you safely scan in an OT environment? So this had, uh, historically this had been a, a lot more of a challenge in OT environments, which in, in some uh, well-earned way is, is why uh, engineering teams in OT environments are a little wary about vulnerability management. Uh, the historical OT or vulnerability management scanners would very quickly knock over uh, Windows embedded machines because they just really weren't designed for uh, handling the type of scans that, that those scanners would, would put out. Thankfully, these days there are a lot better ways to do this. Part of that is, is uh, doing passive scanning on the network to be able to, to capture traffic and identify to fingerprint assets to be able to understand what they're doing and, and what protocols they're using. And uh, furthermore, there are new vulnerability management uh, products, and Tenable actually just acquired one, uh, that are focused on those, uh, those OT asset classes and working with those OT manufacturers to understand the languages that those assets are using and only query in ways that are safe. So very important if you're looking to do scanning in an OT environment that you understand the assets that are there and scan safely because using some of the, the older versions of scanners can, can very quickly cause problems. Awesome, I think that is all the questions that we have for today. All right, well thank you everyone for taking part of your day today to, to listen to this episode and look forward to hearing from you the next time around.